God's masterpiece. And the text we want to look at this morning, it's uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. But God's mercy is so great, He loves us so very much. Though we were spiritually dead because of the things we did against God, He gave us a new life with Christ. You have been saved by God's grace. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? Just a simple text like this. We were, you were spiritually dead. That's not good. Is it good? No, no. no that's not good. This is horrible. This is not good. But God has changed that. And you are not spiritually dead anymore. So we want to talk about what it means to be spiritually alive and what it means to you as well. This text resembles the first chapter of Genesis and many other texts that we see in the Bible where God's intervention brings life. Uh, you have then the Genesis chapter 1. It opens, the book of Genesis opens with desolation, chaos, darkness, death. And then you find a manifestation of divine power. God intervenes. The Holy Spirit is hovering over this chaos. And then there is the creation of life. Life comes on the earth. And then the human being is being created. And you find the same thing in this text. Chaos. Death. No life from God. God's intervene. But God who is rich and mercy. And then there is a life that comes. We, you, have been made alive. Praise God. Amen. You're alive this morning. When Ephesians chapter 2 opens, it opens that we were dead in our sins and in our trespasses. That's how the, the chapter begins. We're, when it begins, we're spiritually dead. When the second chapter finish, we are seated on the heavenlies with Jesus Christ, and we form a holy habitation by the Holy Spirit where God dwells. Isn't that great? At first it starts, we are dead, then we are elevated with Christ, and then we become a, a, a habitation uh, of God with God. And this is a mighty miracle that God is, has done in each one of us. And you know, after time passed in our Christian life, we forget this awesome, extraordinary miracle that God has done for you individually and for me. We forget it. We take it for granted. It's like marriage life. You know, you're madly in love and then suddenly, a few years down the road, you take each other for granted. It's not so magical anymore. It's not so romantic anymore. It's just like, well, depends for who. But, you know, it's often the case like this. And for God, it's the same. He has done an awesome, extraordinary work in your life. Amen? Amen. This is what God has done. Because you were unable to, to do that. Then we go to the next slide. And we see the words, but God. And this is the, the, the big, big things. Uh, because it is the most inspiring expressions of any literature you may read. But God. When you see but God or but He or but Christ, it means that a change is about to take place. Something existed in a certain state, then when you see the words but God, it announced something extraordinary. God's going to do something. And this is how we are meant to live our life. Always with the hope and the expectations of the but God all along our Christian life. This is not a one-time thing of the past, but it is something that is a living relationship. God, but God is always there. But God is always available. But God is always able. But God is always listening. But God is always near. God is always the same, and God is always loving, and God's mercy has never stopped, but God is for you. Amen? Amen. And that is so wonderful. Just as a person is physically dead, it cannot respond to stimulus. You can take a needle, you know, and prick a dead body, and it's not going to move. It's not going to feel whatever you do. So a spiritually dead person is unable to respond to spiritual things, to the things of God and the, the will of God, the purposes of God, the work of God. It's impossible to understand. A, co a corpse does not hear any conversation. You know, if you have a, 
uh, a tomb at the funeral home, and then people come and line up, and you look inside the, 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 the tomb to the dead. You may talk to him as long as you want. You may cry, you may sing a song. It's not going to sing. It's not going to change anything. He's, he's, he's dead. He has no appetite for food or drink. He feels no pain. He is dead. And what this person needs is a resurrection. It's not only a, re a resuscitation or something. And many, like the same thing with the spiritual dead person, the spiritual faculties, the ability to hear, to receive, to comprehend, to communicate, to enjoy, is not there. All of these uh, things that you, you, you can enjoy with a relationship with God, when you are spiritually dead, it's, it's non-functioning. You, you don't have that. You're dead. Okay? So and it, the cause of that, it is transgression. And this, this text shows us, uh, maybe we can look to the next uh, slide, the pictures, just to give us a, uh, an illustration. Sometimes illustrations stick to our mind more than words. Man is created to have fellowship with God. And then you see here body, soul, and spirit. You see the dark spirit. The spirit is dead. It's not functioning. It's not responding to God. There's a separation between God's spirit, God's life, and the spirit of man. So here Romans 3.23, all men have sinned and fell short of the standards of God. Romans 6.23, and the, the, the wages of sin is, is death. So it produces a, a death that leads to, to eternal justice and, and hell. And keep you into a bondage of religion. You may try to be moral, to do good works, but it's not going to change that relationship with word. You, you are unable. Your spiritual functions are not functioning. It's like the dead body in the tomb. You can sing, you can tickle him, you can do anything. It's not responding to any stimulus. It's the same thing. Anything from God is not going to work. There is no life. There may be religion, there may be an appearance of, of, uh, of spirituality, but there is no true spirituality, but only the, the, the judgment of God that will come. So when you believe in Christ, faith in Christ, that this is what we are talking about. There's an intervention of God, but God loved and He sent His Son. So when we believe in Him, then there is a restoration, there is a quickening, there is a coming to life that will continue to go into eternal life. So this is a, just a simple picture, but you see, here there is abundance. There is enjoyment, there is relationship, there is blessing, there is uh, an exchange, a divine exchange. There is an understanding. Here there is nothing of God. There is a separation, but there is a destination. And then we need to, to think about, about these things. The focus is on God. If you go back to the previous uh, picture, God is rich and mercy. But God is rich in mercy. This is how there are two, two descriptions of God here. The focus is not on what we were. Now the focus is what God wants to do. The rest of the chapter is about what God is doing, has done, and wants to do in you. And the, the thing that, that started it is that because of His great love and because God is rich in mercy. Mercy is that God did not treat us like we deserved. If God treated us like we deserve, we'd be dead, condemned, finished. We'd be in hell already. But God, because of His great love, because of His great mercy, His great love has created a plan, a plan, a solution for us. And the great mercy has come to us. And the second thing that we learn is that He made us alive. He, he resurrected us, a supernatural force that is uh, working in our lives. And the next, I think if you click, you will have another scripture is coming uh, at the bottom, is it? Yes? Yeah? Or maybe in the next slide, I'm not sure. Philippians 2.13, supposed to be there. For it is God who works, producing, and you both the desire and the ability to do what pleases Him. And there are many ways to, to describe this, but it is a work of God. 
It is a work of God inside of us, a supernatural work of God and energizing. You know the word that is uh, God is uh, as work is a word energia. It's the energy of God. It's the inner working. That's what energia uh, means in Greek. It's working inside. What was dead, what was sleepy, what was unable to communicate with God comes alive. It is uh, awakened. And the, the Greek word is revitalized, uh, make alive, give life, reanimate. You know, that is what is God is, is doing in us. What was not functioning or is unable to function will start to be active, will produce an active life in us. And we have experienced that in our lives. We have started this new life. We have walked with the Lord. And at some point in our lives, we have been very excited about that. Is that true? You've been excited about being made alive, that you have realized that the change took place and that you became a new person. I remember the night, and I mentioned it many times, but it is so true. The day I was born again, that night, I went home to my mother. Instead of going to a party, I went home to her. And uh, I came out in the house, and the first thing I told my mom, Mom, you know what happened? I am born again. I was not sure to understand exactly what it meant. But I knew that something important that uh, took place with us. Mom, I'm born again. And then it started from that. The next day I was in church, and you know that my life has been changed from, from, uh, from that time on. You know, our, our old self, begins a new directions, new emotions, uh, new, new goal. Uh, and we are not governed by the selfish impulses like we, we were uh, before. We have new desire. And that's what this verse says. God works producing in you a, b a bunch of series of things. Uh, in certain Bible version it says the will and the do. It produced the will and the do. But here it says the desire, the understanding, the willingness to do, it produced that. God produced it in us. He puts it there. You know, before you were not interested in reading the Bible. You were not thinking about these things. Going to church was not really important. But wh 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 where does that all come from, this new desire? God put it there. To serve. Why, why should be someone volunteer? Why, why would someone give money to the missions or something? Why would someone quit his job, go to Bible school, become a pastor or a missionary? Why, why do people sacrifice uh, their life and go to prison for their faith? Where does that willingness come from? It is God who produces in you, gives you this energy, this inner working, and he, he, he does it with, with us. And because all of this... If you look at the original scriptures that we are reading, it says together with Christ. Everything that you read about this is in Christ, with Christ, together with Christ. It's the quality of life. This is a description of the quality. Before you were on your own, with your human will, and separated from God, your life was in, in a mess or inefficient, not producing anything. And then, now, in Christ or together with Christ, that's the quality of life. A, a life that is resembling the life of Jesus Christ, the motives of Jesus Christ, the desire of Jesus Christ are in you. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 10. Next slide, I think you will find that. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew. And that I want to insist on that. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things planned that he has planned for us long ago. He has created us anew. He has done a new, a new work with us. Okay, Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. For I can do everything, again, through Christ who gives me strength. If you pay attention, the quality of our life the efficiency of our life, the fruitfulness of our life, the, the, the goals, the things that we will do with our lives, it's because 
we can do these good things that God has done because he has created us a new in Christ. It's in Christ. Through Christ, he gives us strength to do all sorts of, of things. Uh, verse 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. In this text, I just want to make a point here. This text that Paul is giving us right here is not in a text of just like easy going. It's a text where Paul says he has been going without food. He has been going in prison. He has been going through sufferings. And sometimes he has been very much blessed and he was having money and he was having plenty. And he says that this is the context in which he's, he's talking about. And this same God who takes care of me, whether I have plenty or little, will supply all of our needs according to his riches. God can do it, which has been given to us in Christ Jesus. No worry about what we have, don't have, and the situations that we have. I, I was thinking about the, the pastors in Bangladesh when I'm, I'm uh, reading this text. This God who takes care of me according to his great riches will provide because this has been given to us. The great riches have been given to us through Jesus Christ. Whether there is suffering, injustice, persecutions, God gives what you need. Whatever, it's not only money, because many times we, we look at this verse, God will provide, and then means, oh, provide. The word provision means money. It doesn't mean money only. It means whatever is needed in your spiritual walk with God. If, it is, if you need money for missions, money will be there. But if you need uh, grace to bear in suffering, it will be given to you. You need patience to go through a trial, it will be given to you. God will provide according to his riches, which is beyond money. It's much, much bigger than, 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 than money. Your life, spiritual life, begins with Christ. That's how it begins, with God moving into your life. But it must continue in the same way. And that's the problem that I'm coming to now. I think this one is quite clear. We understand that quite well. This is nothing new what I'm saying. Our spiritual life, we were dead spiritually. Now we have been quickened. We are alive in Christ and we are walking the life. But are we really spiritually alive today? What does that mean to you today? Are you living the life that God, are you doing the work that God has prepared for you to do? Are you ready for what God, are you, can you do everything? I mean, we look at this verse and we say, yeah, but then when it's time to do it, we ignore it. We're not there. We're not listening, you know, something like that. Yeah. Okay, think of a relationship. Uh, you can see the difference between a dead relationship, like a relationship between couple, for example, like this boring, no enthusiasm, no dialogue, huh? and compare it to another type of relationship between couple where there is romance, where there is electricity, where there is sparks, where there is interest, where there is dialogues, where there is a response on both sides. It's completely different, isn't it? Yeah, hello? Yes, it is different. Yes, we understand that, okay? With Jesus Christ, is the same thing. The, my relationship with Jesus Christ may have had some good moments in the past, but maybe it doesn't really have a lot of it. Uh, okay, example. If you are married here today, you will understand that. If you are a woman, <laughs> and probably you have experience when you talk to your husband, and the answer you get is, Huh? <laughs> yeah. What? And it's like the, the husband is like barely listening to what has been said before. Huh? What? Huh? What, what, what did you say? Something like this. I think many women will say, yes, I know that experience. Okay. So that's what happened in our life with, with Christ Jesus. We have been coming alive into a relationship, but is this relationship being alive right now at the moment that's that's the point you know the 
the, to be alive in Christ carries the idea of being awake, okay? If uh, you try to talk to someone who is sleeping or sleepy, uh, you may have a, uh, yeah, yeah. Do you hear me? Mm, yeah, okay. You will have something like this, okay? So, to be alive carries the idea of being awake. Now you are awake, okay, <laughs> by the way. You are, you are of being alert. Being alert, what does that mean? Being alert means being attentive, being ready to catch anything. You're not missing what's happening. I don't know if you are with me, but sometimes when I'm with a group of people, it's like my, I don't have enough ears. My ears is listening to a conversation going this way and that way. It's just it's like you don't want to miss anything. Like you are alert to, uh, to everything. And to be in a state of readiness. Because if the Holy Spirit is going to do anything with you, you have to be alert. You have to be ready. If you are not, if you are like, hmm? uh, oh God, you speak to me? What do you say? And then, how, how, can you, how can you serve God if you have this kind of, uh, uh, of attitude? And, and you, you recognize yourself, okay? You are in the prayer room. Well, God wants to speak to you. <laughs> and all this. So that's, that's many times where our spiritual life is. And that's very unfortunate because it is not going to fulfill the intentions and the activities of God in this way. In Luke chapter 12, verse 35 to 37, we have a, a text here that I want to bring to you. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men or women who are waiting for, like in a state of alertness, we are waiting for their master to come home. And um, so that, verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake. Not sleepy when you're awake. You know, when Jesus went into the garden of uh, Gethsemane, he says, can you pray with me for one hour? And they all fell asleep. Is that right? Yeah. And he told them, pray, because you will fall into temptation because the, 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 the spirit is willing. And this is true. All of us, we can agree with that. Is that right? Yeah. The spirit is willing. We agree with everything the Word of God says, all the promises of God, we say yes. We raise our hands, we come to the altar, we pray to God, use me. But then the flesh is weak. Is that right? Yes, it does. So Jesus says, will you pray with me for an hour? And they all go to sleep. And here it says, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. When the master comes to us, for uh, uh, an event, uh, situations, uh, uh, missions, uh, something to say to someone, a prayer that he wants you to pray for someone, a, a gesture that he wants you to, to have, put your hands on your brothers or, or notice somebody who is hurting. But we are too sleepy to notice, we are too sleepy to hear, we are too sleepy to even pray correctly because we are not spiritually alive at the moment, and we are not in a state of readiness or alert, we are kind of in a sleepy mood. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. And to Sardis, the church of Sardis says, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Like you have a reputation, you look like you're doing the, the, the right things. You are active, you, you move, but spiritually, you are not alive, you are dead. And you better uh, wake up and strengthen, and then it talks about repenting, reminding, reminding where you were, what you were, what you had with the Lord going on, uh, the excitement, the relationship that you, you, you once had, and then repent and return and do it. Because if you do not, then the rest that remains is about to die. It's not dead yet, but it's dying. And this is a serious thing for, for Christians. If our Christian life is going to die, is there something worse? Like we all agreed at the beginning that we have been made alive and Christ was the most wonderful transformation, the expression, but God is the most, uh, you know, uh, astonishing expression in literature because it involves a change, a powerful uh, intervention of God. But now we're talking about maybe years down the road, we are now being told we are about to die. This is a sad 
state to be in. But unfortunately, in Christianity around the world, this is where churches and people in the churches who, who clap their hands, sing the songs, give money to the offerings, may find themselves in. They, they, they just have a, a traditions, they, they keep on going to church, all this, and they don't have this, this spark, this relationship that I was describing uh, before. We have the five uh, foolish virgin, you know, and Matthew 25, 5 says, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all sombered slumbered and slept. They were sleeping in the middle of the night. There's a shout. He is coming. And then some of them cannot do anything. B by the time they, they should have been waiting at the door, being alert in a state of readiness, they went to buy oil because they, 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 they ran out of oil. And when the, the bridegroom came, they were left because they, they were not ready to do anything. They were not ready. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And the text, in the context of Ephesians 5 and in Colossians, you have a parallel there. It talks about darkness, that we are not children of darkness. A lot of evil happens in darkness. Drunkenness happens in darkness. Uh, thieves, robbing usually happens in darkness. Uh, cheating wives is happen in darkness. Uh, lots of gambling happens in darkness. A lot of the, the wrong things, the wrong places are being practiced in darkness during the night. So if anything is not according to the light, or lived in the light, or uh, honest before God, or pleasing to the, to the Lord, it says, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead so that the light of Christ can, can shine upon your life and clear out all of the darkness and you can live. You know, there are many, many things and described in the New Testament that uh, makes us sleepy or distracted or crowded in our minds or divided minds and all of this. Uh, it makes us sleepy to the things that God has planned for us. God has plans. We all agree with that. God has promises. We say yes and amen. But then if we are sleepy, we cannot receive. We cannot grasp and we cannot do these kind of things. Sometimes we become more alive to the things of this world than we are to the things of God. I want to give you a few examples of people in the Bible who were alive spiritually. David, for instance, we know David, a so great the mighty hero, David, when he fought against Goliath. What made David ready? You know, there were thousands of soldiers, Israelite soldiers on the mountain in front of Goliath. They've been there for months, facing each other. Why none of these tens of thousands of God-believing Israelite soldiers, none, not one, came against Goliath. And then this little shepherd boy come, you know, bringing cheese and bread to his brothers, and he's, I will fight him. I will fight him, you know. And then they said, no, you're, you're ridiculous. You're, you know, you cannot do that. He says, I fought the, the bear. I fought the lions. And this God who helped me, I, I've, I, I'm doing it. That's how I live. I can do it, you know. What? made David ready on that day while thousands and tens of thousands of God believing soldiers could not for months be ready. That's a question to ask ourselves. What makes people respond to God? Well, you know the psychologist that says, what makes people click? What, what makes you tick? You know? Uh, what touch you and make, get you into actions? Some of them is fear, punishment, or, you know, if you are uh, going to go to prisons, you know, some people, they go to a drug rehab center if the, because the court says, if you don't go to drug rehab, you will go to prison. Okay, I'll go to drug rehab, you know. And so, so there's all sorts of reasons why people function. Some of them, they function because of love. You know, they want to please because they love so much, and that's the best, the best way. But there are so, so many things. So David was ready on that day. Joseph. What about Joseph? Genesis 41, 38. So Pharaoh asked his officials, 
Can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? You know, just before that, where was Joseph? In the prison. How long has he been there? For years. A long time. Too long. He could have been like so moody, gloomy, bitter, angry, like injustice, injustice. Now I'm going to the king and I'm going to use political rights. You know, I will fight for my human rights and I'm going to go there. But no, ins instead, he explained the dream and he has a solution that saves the whole nations. And then Pharaoh can only say, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? So how many of us, it can be said of us, so obviously filled with the Holy Spirit. You see people and then you just know how much they love Jesus, they're excited. When you are near them, you just feel good. They, they, they make you feel good because they have a spirit of kindness and humility and they just build you up and all of this. Hallelujah. You know, like uh, the, the, the pastors that we have seen not too long ago, that is uh, the group of uh, uh, Sister Julie. You know, you can tell a lot by the attitudes of someone, you know. They are big pastors. They are all pastors of mega church. It's, it's not a small church like Lighthouse. They come here, we sit together, we eat together, and they make you feel like you are the greatest. You know, they are humble, they talk with you, there is no sense, you sit with them, there is no sense, I'm the big pastor, you know. There is not this kind of things. So it tells you some, but something about, about them. Daniel. Daniel is described in a very, very special, special way. Daniel 6, verse 3. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because, what? Hello? Oh, maybe you don't see it. Yes? It's too low. Should put the text higher. Because an excellent spirit was in with him. And the king planned to set him over the old kingdom. What is this excellent spirit means? What, what, is, it, what is it about? Some Bible says an extraordinary spirit was with him. And the word means preeminent, exceeding, excellent over and above like his spirit that did was it intelligence was it wisdom was it what it was his character they couldn't find anything he was blameless they tried there was a group of people jealous and they searched into his life they searched into his secrets they tried to find something to accuse him of anything they couldn't find a single thing he had a, outstanding, superior spirit in him. Caleb, what about Caleb? My servant Caleb, n number 14, verse 24. Caleb, because he has a different spirit. So you see you have outstanding, superior spirit, obviously filled with the Holy Spirit, as a different spirit, and has followed me fully. I will bring him into the land. What does that mean? Uh, another spirit. Not only he was bold, he was courageous and heroic, but that means that the, his spirit was being influenced by God. He was, he was on God's side. And at the exact moment of need, when everybody was speaking against going to the land, he stood with Joshua and they spoke out and they were almost stoned because of their, of their stand as a result. And there was no human fear and to them. And that, that's, that's why God says, he, f he followed fully. And the, the words is very important, literally. He, he, filed, he filed after me. Like he came behind me in a satisfying way. He satisfied me, God says. He felt he came, the way that he came on my side, that he came behind me, and that he gave me glory is making me fully happy. That's what it means that, he, that uh, Caleb, Caleb has done. So let's go up at once and occupy, for we are well able to overcome it. That's what he says. And Joshua in him, when they, they came in chapter 14, he says, If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. 
uh, don't rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread to us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So they stood. They had a different spirit from the others, and because of that, God honored, honored their faith. What about in the New Testament? Pastor Jennifer was talking about Stephen, and we talked about it in the, in the, in the Bible uh, lately. They could not withstand, it says Acts chapter 6, verse 10, they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And when they were looking at his face, they saw his face like the face of an angel. I mean, you know, when people are angry with you and they are threatening you to, to, to kill you, is your face going to, to be like the face of an angel? <laughs> But that's what Stephen, because it's, he was he was in another uh, level with, with, with God. So that is so that's why I'm asking this morning, uh, what is your spiritual state? Are you alert? Are you ready? Are you usable by the Lord? Are you half listening? Are you half asleep? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Where do you stand? You need you need to. to to, to, to decide by yourself what you want to do. In Luke chapter 21, verse 34 to 36, constantly be on your guard so that your hearts will not be loaded down with self-indulgence and other things. Self-indulgence is our nature. That's the directions that we will automatically flow into if the Holy Spirit is not quickening and making us go to another. And it says constantly be on your guard. That means stay awake here and huh? be on your guard, be attentive, be alert, and know what's important in your life, you know. Don't just drift away, don't don't let the the world around you mold you into its own uh, mold. The worries of this life or this day will take you by surprise like a trap and that's what happened to many Christians they have a good beginning they live the life and then suddenly you find out down the road they are in a trap they're not there anymore they fell into some sorts of trap because we have a very dangerous enemy that is very alive and against God's plan for our life so be alert at all times praying that you may have strength and that is what we we need we need we need to do the power is here the energy of god is available we have everything to remain alert and to glorify god and and all of this for it is god who works in you go to the another slide the philippians 2 13 for it is god who works in you energizing and creating in you both the power and the desire and the ability to do what pleases him God must work in us before he can work through us or use us. And maybe this morning you feel tired, you know, like, like sleepy, but sleepy because y your, your spirit is tired. There is rest in God, you know. So when we find ourselves tired, it's not quitting or necessarily stopping that is important or the solution. It's to rest in God. God can always refresh. He can always quicken. You, you find it all along the, the, the Bible. The, the dry bones in Ezekiel. I will give you a new spirit. I will give you a new heart. Give you water. Uh, one, uh, it, it, maybe we can go back to uh, John chapter 4 verse uh, 14. This is a very good in, uh, illustration. I want to close with that. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring which will provide them with life-giving water and give them eternal life. It will be like a spring flowing inside constantly. You know, sometimes you go to a nice park and you have like a fountains, you know, like a, a show, you know, the water show, something like that. It's fascinating. It's almost hypnotize us. You, you look at the beauty and the, it, there's power. There is like emergence of water, the, the, the gushing out. And the, the, now they make it dance. They make it do ballet. They make it, you know, with music, you know, and everything. It's beautiful. 
it's beautiful, but it, 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 it reveals so much energy and power, you know, sometimes boosh, boosh, it just come out. And this is the, the life and the spirit when needed. The life of God just gush out and, and, and inside of us. A fresh bubbling spring. You know bubbling? You know bubbling? You know, some, some people are bubbling with joy. Some people are bubbling with words. They speak all the time. Uh, bubbling, bubbling. So life, life is a very key concept in, in, the, in, in the Gospel of John. John used the word life a lot in his writing. 36 times the word life comes in the Gospel of, of John. And this is a very, very, it's like a package that you receive when you have God inside of you. This fountain keeps bubbling up, gushing out, flowing through, fresh, always, and it goes on and on and on. And uh, this, is, this is really, really uh, wonderful. It's, it's, this is what God provides for each one of us. So this morning, if you are tired, there's a fountain there. Maybe the, 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 the tap has not been open recently, and, and the, the fountain show is not being displayed. But it can be. Just open the flow of the Holy Spirit. There is life. God, but God made us alive in Christ. And this is when we are alive that we can, we can serve. God is interested in your life. Because if you are not functioning inside, you, can, you cannot function outside. You cannot fulfill the task, the things that he has prepared. The last slides, we will finish with the last, the last slide. From death to life, to be God's masterpiece, to, do, to fulfill, to do the things that God has prepared in advance. We are not able to do that without being alive. Being, uh, being continually alive, continuing to be alive. And, and that's the role of the church. That's what we are meant, meant to be. Amen? Can we stand this morning? Hallelujah.